Hi everybody and welcome to this little video. This video shares the story of the Carpathia and her connection to the Titanic and then later a connection of sorts to the Mauritania. The Carpathia, which you can see on the screen at the moment, was a Cunard Line transatlantic passenger steamship built by Swan Hunter and Wigan Richardson at Wall's End. Launched in 1902, the Carpathia made her maiden voyage in 1903 from Liverpool to Boston. In April 1912, she became famous for rescuing the survivors of the White Star Line's Titanic after it struck an iceberg and sank with the loss of 1,500 lives in the North Atlantic Ocean. Ever since I was little, I've had a fascination with the Titanic, but it wasn't until recent years that I learnt of the World's End connection to the disaster. On the night of the 14th of April 1912, the Carpathia's wireless operator, Harold Cottam, who you can see, well you can't because my screen's gone a little bit funny, who you can see on the screen at the moment. So Harold Cottam had missed some messages from the Titanic as he had been on the bridge at the time, but after his shift ended at midnight, he continued listening to the transmitter before he went to bed. And he received messages from Cape Cod, Massachusetts, stating that they had private traffic for the Titanic. He thought he would be helpful at 12.11 a.m. on the 15th of April 1912. He sent a message to the Titanic stating that Cape Cod had traffic for them. In reply, he received the Titanic's distress signal stating they had struck an iceberg and were in need of Im immediate urgent assistance. Cottam took the message and coordinates to the bridge where the officers on watch were initially sceptical about the seriousness of the Titanic's distress call. The Titanic had been advertised as unsinkable, so I would guess we can understand why many would have thought the distress calls to be a mistake. Cottam then rushed to the captain's cabin and awakened Captain Arthur Henry Roston who immediately sprang into action and gave the order to turn the ship around. He did ask Harold Cottam if he was absolutely certain it was a distress signal from the Titanic and Cottam said he had received the distress signal from the Titanic which required immediate assistance and that he was absolutely certain of the seriousness of the message. Captain Rostrum set a course for the Titanic and sent for the chief engineer and told him to make all possible speed to the Titanic as she was in trouble. Rostrum would later testify that the Titanic was some distance away and that it took the Carpathia three and a half hours to arrive at the Titanic's location, by which time she had already sunk. Rostrum ordered the ship's heating and hot water to be cut off in order to make as much steam as possible available for the engines and had extra lookouts on watch to spot icebergs. Cotton, meanwhile, messaged the Titanic that the Carpathia was coming as quickly as possible and that they expected to reach their location within four hours. Cotton refrained from sending more signals after this, trying to keep the network clear for the Titanic's distress signals. The Carpathia reached the edge of the ice field by 2.45 a.m., and from there they sailed somewhat slower as they dodged icebergs that ground along their hull plates. The Carpathia arrived at the distress calls position at 4 a.m., approximately an hour and a half after the Titanic went down, claiming more than 1,500 lives. For the next four hours, the ship, the ship took on around 705 survivors of the disaster from the Titanic's 20 lifeboats. Survivors were given blankets and coffee and then escorted by stewards to the dining rooms. Others went on deck to survey the ocean for any sign of their loved ones. The Carpathia's own passengers assisted in any way that they could, offering warm food, beverages, blankets, accommodation and words of comfort. By 9am, the last survivor had been picked up from the lifeboats and Rostrum gave the order to sail away from the area. So that went a little bit faster than I wanted. That These are a couple of photos of some of the survivors actually on board the Carpathia. After considering options where to disembark the passengers, Rostron consulted with Bruce Ismay and ultimately decided to disembark the survivors in New York City 
the original destination of the RMS Titanic. News of the disaster rapidly spread on shore and the humble Carpathia became the centre of a tense, intense media attention as she steamed westward towards New York at an average speed of 14 knots. Rostrin ordered that no news stories would be transmitted directly to the press, deferring such responsibilities to the White Star offices as Cotton provided details to the Titanic sister ship, the Olympic. On Wednesday, the 17th of April, scout cruiser USS Chester began escorting the Carpathia to New York. Cotton, by then assisted by the Titanic's junior wireless operator, Harold Bride, who you can see on the screen at the moment with Harold Cotton, transmitted the names of the third class survivors to the Chester. Slowed by heavy thunderstorms and fog since the early morning of Tuesday the 16th of April, Carpathia finally arrived in New York on the evening of Thursday the 18th of April 1912 under heavy rain. This photo shows the contact between Harold Cotton and the Olympic stating that they had arrived at the scene of the disaster and how many passengers they had picked up and who was in the vicinity of, at the time. For their rescue work, the crew of the Carpathia were awarded multiple medals by the survivors. Sorry, that is a picture of the Carpathia arriving at New York. Yeah, not very good at these videos, but we're getting there. For their rescue work, the crew of Carpathia were awarded multiple medals by the survivors. Crew members were awarded bronze medals. Officer silver medals and the captain rostron a silver cup and gold medal presented by Margaret Molly Brown, which you can see in this photo here. Margaret Molly Brown was known as Unsinkable Molly Brown. She was on a few passenger liners that sank, so it might have been a good idea not to get on board if she was on. Rostron was knighted by King George V and was later a guest of President William Taft at the White House where he was presented with a Congressional Gold Medal, the highest honour the United States Congress could give any individual. Joseph Carr was an 18-year-old waiter on board Carpathia. After participating in the rescue, he kept a Titanic life jacket as a souvenir and donated it in 1938 to the Maritime and History Museum of Croatia. It is one of the five known and confirmed original life jackets from the Titanic and the only one preserved and permanently displayed in Europe. Cotton continued to work as a shipboard wireless operator on various ships until 1922 when he married Elsie Jean Shepperson and took a job as a sales representative of the Minimax Fire Extinguisher Company. Cotton retired in 1958 and moved to Nottingham where he died in 1984. This picture, which I don't know if you can see it all, but hopefully you can. This picture is showing you the words that was on a plaque that was unveiled in honor of Cotton after his death. On the 15th of July, 1918, the Carpathia departed from Liverpool in a convoy bound for Boston, carrying 57 passengers and 166 crew. The convoy travelled on a zigzag course along with an escort in accordance with procedures against submarine attacks. The escort left the convoy early in the morning of the 17th of July. The Carpathia continued west along with six other ships and as the largest ship in the convoy she assumed the role of the Commodore ship. Three and a half hours later at 9.15am while sailing in the southwest approaches a torpedo was sighted approaching her port side. The engines were thrown in full astern and the helm was turned hard to starboard, but it was too late to avoid the torpedo. The Carpathia was torpedoed near the number three hatch on the port side of the, by the Imperial German Navy submarine SMU-55, followed by a second which penetrated the engine room, killing three firemen, two trimmers and effectively disabling her ability to escape. As the engines were rendered unoperable by the second torpedo impact. As a result, Captain William Potherow, in command of the Carpathia since 1916, signalled the other ships in the convoy to send out wireless messages 
by use of flags. He then had rockets fired to attract the attention of nearby patrol boats. The remaining convoy steamed away at full speed to elude the submarine. Prothero gave the order to abandon ship. All passengers and the surviving crew members boarded the 11 light bulbs as the Carpathia slowly started to sink. There were 218 survivors of the 223 on board. As the passengers and crew disembarked, Prothero, the chief officer, first and second officers and the gunners remained on the sinking ship, seeing to it that all the confidential books and documents were thrown overboard. The captain then signalled one of the lifeboats to come alongside and he and the remaining crew members abandoned their ship. The submarine surfaced and fired a third torpedo into the ship's into the ship near the gunners' rooms, resulting in a massive explosion that doomed the Carpathia. The submarine started approaching the lifeboats when the HMS Snowdrop arrived on the scene and drove away the submarine with gunfire before picking up the survivors from the Carpathia. The Snowdrop arrived back in Liverpool with the survivors on the evening of the 18th of July. The Carpathia sank at 11am at the position recorded by the Snowdrop about one hour and 45 minutes after the torpedo strike and approximately 120, 120 miles west of Fastnet in Ireland. At the time of her sinking, the Carpathia was the fifth Cunard steamship sunk in as many weeks. In 2000, the American author and diver Clive Cussler announced that his organisation, NUMA, had found the wreck of the Carpathia in the spring of that year at a depth of 500 feet it was found that the Carpathia had landed upright on the seabed. The NUMA gave the approximate location of the wreck as 125, 120 miles west of Fastnet in Ireland, which was the same location that the, given at the time she sank. Rostron had continued in command of the Carpathia for a year before transferring to the Coronia. It's here that we find the connection to another war Zen ship, the Mauritania. He went on to captain several other ships including the Mauritania during World War I and he then returned to command of the Mauritania after it returned to normal passenger service in June 19, 1919. After his retirement in May 1931 he became a member and later captain of the Southampton Master Mariners Club and he wrote his autobiography Home from the Sea. When the Mauritania sailed to Scotland to the shipbreakers in 1935, and this is not a photo of that occasion, this is just another photo of the Mauritania, Rostron was supposed to have been on board. However, overcome with emotion, he refused to board her and instead waved farewell from the pier side, preferring to remember the ship as she was when he commanded her. During his time commanding the Mauritania, the ship was nicknamed the Rostron Express, by passengers due to Rostron's determination to stick completely to the ship's scheduled departures and arrivals. I hope that you've all enjoyed that little video, which, like I say, it tells you the connection between the Carpathia, the Titanic and the Mauritania, even if it is just a little link. And yeah, I'm still rubbish at making videos, but hopefully I'll get better as time goes on.